Hello, my uh, name is Eva Ramirez. I'm the science director at Revotion. And uh, today I'm going to talk about how deep sea ecosystems and extreme ecosystems are fueled. And I'm going to focus in uh, the difference between heterotrophic ecosystems and chemosynthetic ecosystems. We know the deep sea uh, has certain particularities, particularly there it's dark, there is high pressure, and it's cold. Fuel darkness uh, starts at about 250 meters depth. That's where uh, we arbitrarily decide that the deep sea starts because there's no more light for photosynthesis. Pressure increases of one atmosphere every 10 meters. And uh, it is cold, about two to four degrees in most of the deep sea, but in polar areas, it can go below zero. And then we have regions like the Mediterranean, where it's 13 degrees, and uh, the Red Sea, where lowest temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. There are two main trophic systems uh, in the deep sea. We have heterotrophic ecosystems, and we have autotrophic ecosystems. Heterotrophic ecosystems depend on uh, the organic matter produced in the lit zone, so the euphotic zone, where phytoplankton and bacteria use the sun solar energy to produce organic matter. This is then eaten by zooplankton and uh, larger animals, and when these animals die and decompose, it, they fall to the seafloor and uh, form this marine snow, which is organic matter falling to the seafloor, being decomposed by bacteria as it falls to the seafloor, and this organic matter is what feeds the animals on the deep sea floor. And this is the most common way of uh, uh, food supply to the deep sea ecosystems. However, we also have areas where there is in situ primary productivity, and this is called uh, autotrophy, and it, it happens in hydrothermal vents and in cold seeps, amongst a few other e smaller ecosystems. And the uh, primary producers here are bacteria, and they're using reduced chemicals from the hydrothermal vents and the cold seeps coming out in the fluids as sources of energy to produce organic matter. And it's this organic matter that sustains the whole trophic chain. So I'm going to give some examples of uh, heterotrophic ecosystems and then some examples of autotrophic ecosystems. We will start with uh, continental margins. This is between the shelf break and uh, the abyss. And in these uh, continental margins are characterized by uh, high heterogeneity of habitats. You can have rocky outcrops and rocky walls and, uh, and the axis usually is sedimented. And these different habitats support different types of fauna. Continental margins are also conduits for uh, um, uh, water masses and the organic matter that these water masses contain. So there are areas where there is enhanced uh, faunal communities because of this enhanced um, food supply. So in hard rock substrates, for example, on the walls or rocky outcrops, you have filter feeders like corals or crinoids or sponges that are using the particles uh, in the water column to feed. And then in on the axis where it's mostly sedimented, you have detritivorous like sea urchins or holothurians that are taking the organic matter from the sediment and also predators feeding on the rest of the community. Seamounts is another type of heterotrophic ecosystem. These are on the water mountains and they rise a thousand meters or more from the seafloor. And because of the topography of seamounts, it changes the hydrography, the currents around the seamount, which uh, accumulates particles on top of the seamount. And this again provides an enhanced uh, amount of uh, organic matter and food for the fauna around the seamounts. And again, seamounts can have uh, rocky outcrops and can have rocky walls as well as sedimented areas. And this also provides different ecosystems, filter feeders hanging on the rocky outcrops and uh, tritivorous and sedimentary sea feeders in the sediment. And also the predators that come to feed on these uh, communities. Another habitat I will uh, like to talk about is abyssal plains. This is the largest habitat uh, in the deep sea. It covers 75% of the seafloor. And it is basically large, vast expanses of very fine sediment. And if you were diving in a submersible over an abyssal plain, you will feel like you're in a desert. You will see sediment and more sediment. And every so often, you may see an animal, you may see an asteroid, you may see a holothurian eating, uh, feeding on, this, on the organic matter that it has been accumulating on the sediment. However, if you took a sample of this sediment and look at it under the microscope, you will find an amazing variety of uh, fauna. One of the richest biodiversities on Earth, actually, is on abyssal plains. But it's mostly composed of very small animals, mostly uh, millifauna, nematodes, and uh, foraminifera, for example, and also macrofauna, very small animals uh, like crustaceans and mollusks that live on or in the sediment. And now I'm going to talk, uh, give a couple of examples about chemototrophic ecosystems. The first one is hydrothermal vents. 
Uh, this is an image of a Haritumal vent, a black smoker in the Arctic, one that we have recently visited during the Extreme 24 expedition, and the extensive bacterial mats that we found around this uh, black smoker. In Haritumal vents, the fauna, as I, as I said earlier, are, the trophic chain is based on the chemotrophic production of bacteria that are using the reduced chemicals coming out of the in the fluids on the black smokers as a source of energy to produce organic matter. These bacteria can be, as we saw in the image before, forming bacterial mats, uh, free living, but they can also form symbiosis with the larger fauna. And these are, are two examples of extreme symbiosis. The uh, one on the left is uh, Riftia pachyptila, is a giant tube worm from the East Pacific rice hydrothermal vents. And um, this animal doesn't have a mouth or a digestive system. It has an organ called a trophosome, which is basically a sac full of bacteria. And the animal intakes the oxygen and the carbon uh, dioxide and the hydrogen sulfide from the fluids in the black smoker with the plume, the red plume, sends it to the trophosome and there the bacteria use these components to produce organic matter. And this is what feeds the, the worm. This is what uh, gives all the energy to the worm to grow. The other one is an example of a shrimp. This is from the mid-Atlantic ridge. And in this case, the bacteria are not internal, but they're in the gills, on the gills of the shrimp. And again, this shrimp depends completely on the primary productivity of, of this uh, bacterial symbiotic uh, bacteria to obtain its food uh, to grow. So here are just some examples of uh, different uh, hydrothermal vent ecosystems. We have the giant tube worms uh, in the East Pacific rice. We have uh, mollusk gastropods from the Indian Ocean shrimp in the mid-Atlantic reach, then segregations of uh, kiwa crabs in the Antarctic hydrothermal vents, and then the two images on the bottom are from Arctic hydrothermal vents. So we have uh, basically colonized by very small tube worms. And the last ecosystem I wanted to talk about, chemotrophic ecosystem again, is called SIPs. Uh, these again have primary productivity from bacteria using the methane and other reduced chemicals that are coming out on the cold fluid from the cold sieves to produce organic matter and this again sustains highly abundant animal uh, communities. On the top uh, two images, these are sieves from uh, the Arctic again, from the Extreme 24 expedition, showing the high abundant polychaete communities. And then on the bottom, we have two images from the Gulf of Mexico. We have uh, mussels and we have, uh, again, uh, large tube worms. So in summary, two different uh, types of uh, feeding the deep sea ecosystem, heterotrophic systems. The organic matter is produced in euphiotic zone where the sun provides the energy to produce this organic matter. So the deep sea uh, heterotrophic ecosystems are mostly food limited, but in some cases, the food accumulation can be enhanced by the hydrography, like in seamounts or canyons. There is a high biodiversity of small fauna and a low biomass of larger fauna. And the chemotrophic systems, like hydrothermal vents and cold sieves, we have in situ primary productivity. So based from chemotrophic productivity of microorganisms that are at the base of the food chain. And this produces a high biomass of highly adapted organisms, many of them very large. And uh, because of these adaptations, there's high endemicity in these systems. So these animals often only live in hydrothermal vents and cold sieves.